meteorites, alien invaders that race through our atmosphere and crash to Earth without warning. Steve Arnold and Jeff Notkin live to exhume these scientific wonders from deep space. Numero uno! Got one! Yay! They are... Fantastic. The Meteorite Men. For this expedition, the meteorite men are in Arizona. I have a secret stream field in the desert. Their mission, to document the crash site of alien space rocks. What we know for sure is that this is one or two brand new meteorites to science. I'm inspired. I'm ready to go find one. But they'll have to battle the unforgiving climate. It is hot. And leave without upsetting the natives don't notice until they bite into you. Space rocks, traveling at an astounding 17,000 miles per hour. Meteorites careen to Earth and remain buried until now. After months of globe trotting for space treasure, Jeff Notkin and Steve Arnold are back on U.S. soil in Jeff's adopted home state of Arizona. They're motoring to a location deep in the Sonoran Desert. Here, not one, but two unclassified meteorites have recently been unearthed. Only Jeff and a select few know of the exact spot. And until today, he hasn't even shared the intel with Steve. This be the spot, matey. All right. This expedition that we're currently embarked upon is really unlike any other that we've ever participated in. It's a new find, a brand new meteorite to science that we're searching for, which in itself is tremendously exciting and exhilarating for us. And at the end of this hunt, we will take what we found and we will actually witness the classification process where the type of meteorite is positively determined and eventually that meteorite will be given a new name and it will go into the literature for all time. I'm optimistic that this is good ground. If there's something out here, we're going to see it. We're going to find it. And the meteorite men have come prepared. Shovel, big rock pick, gasoline, and extra water. And this dune flag serves a double purpose. It makes us visible when we're driving in rough terrain. If there are other vehicles around, they can see that we're coming. And it's amazing how easy it is to get turned around and get lost when you're out in the desert. I always mark the location of the truck with my GPS before I head out, but in the event I get confused or my GPS is malfunctioning, I can just look for the dune flag, and you can see that from far away. Since the meteorites were found on the ground's surface, they've decided to hunt with simple magnet canes. About 99% of all meteorites are responsive to a good earth magnet. So we're going to actually meet out at the find location. Okay. So I should probably bring my GPS in that case. Oh, yeah, GPS. Um, I might have forgot mine. I might have forgotten. I might have forgotten my GPS. It's not like you need the GPS out in the desert, you know, if you're wandering around all day. It's not like I'll get lost or anything. Yeah, I wouldn't count on it. Does that mean you're going to be following me around? No. No. Maybe. You know, you can get lost and drop dead out here. No, I don't think I'm going to drop dead. Well, I mean, it could happen. It could happen. I think your wife would be very annoyed at me if that happened. I would imagine. But then I would have to say, well, Steve forgot his GPS, so and I wasn't much I, I didn't want to loan him mine, so. Well, I need mine. Of course you do. You might drop dead without it. I don't think that's very likely. I live in the desert. Well, it's an excellent day for hunting. I think so. So we are headed this way. Jeff uses GPS to target the area where the first meteorite was recovered. Just down this way. 
That's where they'll meet Greg Thompson, the man who found the space rocks. He's hoping that the guy's expertise will help him find more. Well, here's the story in a nutshell. You know how often people come up to us and go, hey, look, I found this rock. Is it a meteorite? Yes. So imagine my delight in February of this year when Greg walked into my showroom and said, I found an interesting rock. You know, um, finding the first meteorite was pretty exciting, but I didn't have the knowledge. I didn't even know what a strewn field was. But when I met Jeff and was talking to him and examining the one that I did find, that it had a couple of fractured faces, was telling him that there was a good possibility that there were more in that area. Greg's find, a chondrite, is the most common type of meteorite, formed from clusters of accumulated space dust. After confirming Greg's rock is indeed a celestial jewel, Jeff urged him to go out and search for more. And to Jeff's amazement, Greg found a second meteorite. He took both pieces to our friend Dr. Garvey at okay. ASU, and it seems, against all odds, that they may be two different meteorites, even though they were just found a few hundred feet apart. So, wow. The, okay. odds, the odds of someone out in the desert walking their dog finding one meteorite are minuscule. Right. The odds of one person finding two different meteorites in the same place by accident warrants an expedition, in my opinion. I most definitely. Good. And we're going this way. This way, got it. Is that the famous meteorite hunter? Well, I don't know about famous. <laughs> That's more your, your title. <laughs> Fancy See meeting you, you out yeah. here. Yeah. May I introduce you to Steve Arnold? Steve? This is Greg. Nice to meet this you. Look at this. Wow. Here's the little, the little rock. Greg's find weighs an impressive 2,142 grams and could potentially be worth up to $3,000. And not just a meteorite find, but a new meteorite, right. a beautiful large stone, excellent thumbprinting, very uh -huh. unusual to see such well-defined regmaglyphs. Right. Regmaglyphs are depressions that are made on the surface of some meteorites during atmospheric transit by material melting off their surface. And low in metal, so possibly an L or even an LL. Right. And look at the shock veins. Yeah. Blam, asteroidal collision. Meteorites are typically dark in color, making the pale desert floor an ideal hunting ground. I love this ground. No doubt that Greg, <laughs> that big rock he found, there's no way you can miss it. There's no way we would miss it if we ran upon it. So at least there's the confidence when we walk over an area, if there's a rock sticking up there, we're either going to see it or, or it's not there. <sighs> well, there you go. Most impressive. I'm inspired. I'm ready to go find one. Off he goes. And they're off. The guys are anxious to hunt. But before they begin, Greg has a warning that may save their lives. All right, guys, one of the things I would uh, advise be, uh, keep a sharp eye out for rattlesnakes. There are a lot of them out here and some big ones. OK. Uh, you're likely to encounter javelina as well. For a farm boy like you, that's wild pig. Yeah, I come from the Razorback territory. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, then you know if they get cornered, they can get pretty mean. Yeah. Outside of that, don't stand on the anthills. <laughs> OK. Ouch. Yeah. Ant, snakes. Javelina. Javelina. And cactus. And cactus. And don't turn over rocks with your Scorpions. bare hands. Yes and buzzards. With that, the guys split up to cover more ground. For now, Steve and Greg will hunt together while Jeff goes it alone. It's only noon and the temperature is already tipping 100 degrees. Wow. I don't know if I want to use my sunglasses or not. It's kind of, I hate to block the light out. To facilitate actually looking, you should do it with the sun behind you. Uh, you know, in the, in the, around the noontime, it's not as big of a deal. Um, the, the ideal time is with cloud cover when you really? don't have shadows at all. Um, because, you know, something dark could be sitting in here 
and you, you know, you lose it. Our best hunting is right after sunset, you know, at, kind of at twilight. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Come check this out. Ow. Oh. What do you think? Dude. <laughs> oh. Um. Yeah. Goodness. Wow. That, that is unbelievable. Look at the, the shield shape, shape on of that. It. Wow. That's really oriented. Oh, the, yeah, there, there is no, there is, oh, there is no question. Oh, my goodness. Right here. Right just, here. Just, do you have your other little one? Yeah. Steve examines both rocks. He thinks it's possible this third find could be an entirely different meteorite and not part of either of the first two Greg found. OK, this one's looking a little darker. This one has the little cracks in it, which which is OK. Um, they're both they're both oriented. But this one is just extremely oriented. Like the second meteorite Greg found, this space rock is also oriented. An oriented meteorite is one that is believed to have faced only one direction on its journey to Earth, as opposed to tumbling in all directions. This lack of rotation causes the meteorite to appear rounded on one side, the leading side that received the brunt of the atmosphere's destructive force. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. This is exciting. Now, see how easy it is? You just come out here and... How many hours? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well... Steve's anxious to find Jeff and show him the latest discovery. Using his GPS, they can map the coordinates of where all three rocks were found and plot the strewn field. Half a mile away, Jeff isn't having as much luck finding meteorites as he has hazardous cacti. Ah, uh, the infamous and extremely nasty jumping choya. This is one of the most unpleasant types of cacti. Now, these pieces break off in order for it to reproduce. And those spines will stick to almost anything. They're actually adhering to the tape on my magnet. And they have a little barb at the end, which digs nicely into your skin, can cause a very unpleasant infection. And they're called jumping choya because it seems that if you walk by them, even close, they have this tendency to kind of leap onto your clothes or skin. And they're very difficult to remove. Give those a wide berth. Jeff! What? Check it out! Check out what he found! Oh, come on! What, just now? Yeah. yeah. Just right over there. Yeah. Is, is that just about the most gorgeous looking oriented rock you've ever seen? That is a. Look, look oh, at that. Look yes. At that. That's amazing. There are collectors who would stand on their head and hold their breath. <laughs> for an hour to have this. Okay, so that's three for you. And how many have you found? Zero. <laughs> and I have also found not very many. So, um, well, it's been great hanging out with you. <laughs> if you want to go home now, <laughs> take care. Send me away. Uh, okay. <laughs> I see how this works. <laughs> that's absolutely amazing. Isn't that incredible? Well, you got to spend the morning with Greg, and he's obviously a good luck charm for you. So uh, you should just go that's go fine. that way. You know, go that's really fine. far away. <laughs> The less competition, the better. All right, let's go uh, find something before he does. All right, I'm all for it. <laughs> Greg's third meteorite find is encouraging, and the guys are cautiously optimistic. But searching in an uncharted strewn field presents unique challenges. Normally, when we uh, approach an expedition where we're going into a known strewn field, we strategize as to what part of the strewn field we want to attack. And here, we don't really have that advantage other than we know where uh, these two and now three pieces have been found. Well, I haven't found any meteorites yet, but I've been making all kinds of friends in the desert. Look at this fantastic guy here. Look at those amazing spines on the back of his head, isn't he great? He can sit really still. He thinks I haven't seen him, but I have. I think that's the largest horned toad I've ever seen in the wild. 
looks like a miniature dinosaur. Have you seen any meteorites out here? Jeff's strategy of stealing Greg away from Steve hasn't worked so well for finding meteorites, but they are finding some interesting meteor wrongs. That's amazing. Oh, I've never seen so many together in one place. I didn't either. It's where a bird has made a nest in the swirl cactus, and the cactus has healed itself around that burrow. And then and you can see why they get the name cactus boot, because <laughs> yeah. they look just exactly like a boot. That really does look like a boot. And then when the saguaro dies, they kind of fall out. Actually, it's one of the few plants that leaves a skeleton behind when it dies. OK, so we found horned toad, cactus boot, and you found one meteorite. And it sounds like the rain might be finding us fairly soon. Jeff is feeling pressure to pick up the pace. But gathering storm clouds force the guys to cut their hunt short. When it rains out here, it really rains like a waterfall. And it can be quite hazardous. These small, dry washes can flood very quickly. The desert comes to life when it rains, and non-native life forms, such as myself, run for cover. Well, we've, uh, we've scored one, one meter, I find, uh, as a team. That's just your textbook example of an oriented meteor. Oh, yeah. So um, I'm excited to keep hunting, and uh, you know, in, when you're in a strewn field where there's hundreds of freshly fallen meteorites, sometimes you can go a day or two and not even find one. There are collectors who would stand on their head and hold their breath yeah. to, <laughs> for an hour to have this. That is an amazing example. Yeah, it, and it's, it's going to be worth four or five times more uh, than the identical really? size, say, shape, condition that's not oriented, because oh it's God. just. There's so few of them uh, that um, there's there's a just a high priority. And 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 compare it, compare to, it to yeah, the other one. I I don't even I'm not so sure that they're a match. They're about the right size. This one looks more weathered. It, and it, it, yes, there's there's not the concentration cracks on it. It it might match up with the uh, the first big one. It's got a little bit more of that purple, brownish hue to it. And of course, it, it could determine if one's buried a little bit or if it's, you know, in lower, lower where water would get on it more. One, you know, could weather a little bit different than the other, but. And I mean, what are the chances of finding two oriented meteorites the same size, that close to each other? Normally, if, yes. we, if we were hunting a strewn field and we found numerous stones, maybe one in 10 or one in 50 would be oriented. Yeah. It's, it's, they're rare. And so you found two Ooh, small right. ones, the same size almost. Right. Both brilliantly oriented. OK, so that's three for you. And how many have you found? <laughs> Zero. And I have also uh, found not very many. So, um, well, it's been great hanging out with you. <laughs> if you want to go home now, <laughs> take care. Send me away. Oh, OK. <laughs> I see how this works. <laughs> that's absolutely amazing. Isn't that incredible? <sighs> it is just incredible. I just feel humiliated. <laughs> And, and, you know... <laughs> you, you guys are the professionals here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know. We're yeah, but we taught you how to do it. That's yeah. true. <laughs> Look, you can't God, take credit. You can. how, how can you not see that? I mean, not to take anything away from him seeing it, but... You but, had your sunglasses on. No, I didn't. No? I, I didn't. I almost did. But even with my sunglasses on, it still... It stands out from here. Actually, I think the sunglasses help. And from, from here, I could tell you that it's a meteorite. Yeah. I think if there were thousands of pieces that fell, we would have found multiple pieces already on our hunt today. So um, it's probably not a really huge fall, but nonetheless, uh, we just have to keep covering ground. After a short interlude to wait out a thunderstorm, it's back to work. Steve and Greg have teamed up, and Greg's wife, Wendy, has joined the hunt as well. My wife, Wendy, has never really been into the rock hounding thing like I have. But after the two of us had met with Jeff, and he kind of instilled, you know, the uniqueness of this particular meteorite. Uh, he reinforced the likelihood that there were going to be more here 
I mean, she really kind of got the fever. So we're northwest of where the first one was found. We're just sampling the area, seeing if we can find anything. Uh, hey, Steve? Any meteorites. Yes? This one's got enough traction. I think it's worth taking a look at. Please tell me I finally found it. Doesn't look I quite right don't to me. Think so. Ew. It doesn't have the fusion crust. It doesn't have much on the stick. That's that's a good that's a good, good eye. start. Yeah. <laughs> just my luck. Well, don't give up just yet. <laughs> a mile away, Jeff is using his GPS to mark the last two locations where Greg found space rocks. This is exactly where. Greg's number three was found. And I'm interested in the relationship of the find locations. So I'm going to flag this. And then I'm going to move on to where the second piece was found and try and establish some sort of line in my mind between these two fine sites. Zero. This is the exact find location of the second piece, only 54 meters away. It's amazingly close. Also close. A lot of coyotes. I know where these two pieces were found. My feeling is There were numerous meteorites traveling not in this direction, which is the line upon which they were found, but in this direction. And why do I think that? Because these two pieces are almost exactly the same size and weight, which means they would have fallen at the same time. And that means this, if it is a strewn field, will be the small end. This is where two 10 gram pieces fell at the same time. My feeling is smaller ones that way, larger ones that way. Instead of following the line of flight, I want to see if any others fell at the same time on this axis. And that means following this line due north. Wendy has called it a day. But a mile away, Steve and Greg are still on the hunt. Until... He's close. I heard it. I heard it. He's close. Oh, there we are, right there. there. Right there. Wow. This is why I was telling you, you got to watch for these guys out here. No kidding. There are 17 different species or subspecies of rattlesnakes in Arizona. The reptile's rattle is composed of a series of hollow interlocked segments made of keratin, a substance similar to that of our fingernails. The contraction of special shaker muscles in the tail causes these segments to vibrate against one another, producing the familiar sound. That's nice and encouraging to know. Yeah. Well, that's why you got to keep your eyes peeled. So uh, you don't notice that you're stepping on them until they bite into you. Rattlesnake venom destroys blood and paralyzes nerves. And every year, Arizona has at least one snake bite fatality. OK. You win. You can have this cactus. <laughs> Since we're not here to find snake venom, especially in our legs, uh, we decided to <laughs> mosey on and try to find some meteorites. As day one comes to a close, the guys place a call to their colleague, Dr. Lawrence Garvey at Arizona State University. Hello, Dr. Garvey. Dr. Garvey has given us quite a bit of assistance um, over the last couple years. Well, guess what happened today? We found a third rock. So uh, the mystery continues. He's dropped these not so subtle hints that he'd like to come out in the field with us. Since we're a little bit closer this time, Jeff and I decided we're gonna see if he can come out tomorrow and hunt with us. We need your expertise to take a look at it. And you had mentioned wanting to come out. All right, 
Are we going to give him specific location, or are we going to blindfold him? <laughs> make, it, make him guess. <laughs> make him guess. OK. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff says we need to make you guess. It was pretty exciting. I mean, it was exciting enough to be out here with, with Jeff and Steve, but uh, to actually still find one with them just made it all that much more of an exciting day. Greg, amazingly enough, has found three meteorites now. A novice, an amateur rock hound. It's absolutely great. Didn't get bit by a big rattlesnake. Any day you don't get bit by big rattlesnakes, pretty good day. Good day or not, the guys are hoping for an even better day tomorrow. So nice, clear signal, pretty sharp. One that will bag a large rock from outer space. I think it's worth taking a look at. It's day two for the meteorite men in the Copper State Sonoran Desert. Once again, they've met up with local rock hound Greg Thompson. And their colleague, Dr. Lawrence Garvey, has left his lab to join them in the strewn field. Hey, guys. Good afternoon. Uh, it's one thing when our friends come out and help us. You know, it's fun. But it's quite something else to have Dr. Garvey come down. He's, he's a leading meteorite scientist. And he's also a field guy. He understands hunting. He likes hiking. And it's a treat for us because we've been up to see Dr. Garvey in the lab so many times, but this is actually the first time he's come out in the field to hunt with us. So we're out here, you found something. I mean, I saw a big rock, but yes. I heard you found at least two more meteorites. Is that right. correct? Well, this troublemaker has. Ah, this troublemaker. Do we managed to uh, pour a little bit here. Let's have a look. <clears throat> That's a nice meteorite. That's absolutely gorgeous. That's a beautiful oriented stone, isn't it? See, I told you it was. Yeah. I told you it was oriented. Oh, yeah. This is a fresh stone. And this is quite amazing. I mean, this is, this fell, I would say, right, you know, it's, it's always difficult to estimate weathering rates, but this is the desert, so weathering rates are relatively low. I mean, this hasn't been here very long. I mean, I, I would hate to say much more than a few hundred years at the most. Dr. Garvey examines the second stone, which has similar but distinctively different characteristics. OK, actually, interesting. This one's actually got a broken edge to it, and it's quite light in the inside. Dr. Garvey thinks it's possible the two small meteorites are made from two entirely different meteoroids. The big plan today is to return to the find zone, where Greg made his three discoveries, and head a bit further out into this wild, unexplored area to my right. Why don't, why don't you two Brits go that way, and us two Americans I'll keep him away from the way. snakes. Yeah. OK. OK, then. Very good. Good luck. Good luck, guys. That's the 78-pound magnet on it, so <laughs> just be oh, careful. Great. I mean, it doesn't weigh it, 78 no, pounds. No, it'll, pick, it'll yeah. pick up almost anything. It will, including my truck. OK. Right, let's head off. As the guys hunt, they discuss the possible names that Greg's first meteorite might be given. Normally, it's kind of, they, they want, Usually the nearest post office or landmark that can be spotted on a map that, that can isolate it. So if, if it's from Arizona, it wouldn't necessarily be confused with somewhere else. So, so, so we they don't name it after the person that found it or right. Right. So it wouldn't be the, the Jeff Notkin meteorite. Um, uh, <laughs> or the Greg Thompson meteorite or the Steve Arnold meteorite. Correct. The um, so it could be South Arizona? Established in 1933, the Meteorical Society is an organization founded to promote research and education on the studies of meteorites. It's this body that is responsible for naming all recovered meteorites in the United States. Do they yeah, get even? Th they would probably want to get it pretty close, probably within five or six miles of where it's found. As I understand, you'll be able to make a suggestion, but then they'll settle in on a, an official name. OK. So I could suggest the, uh, the right next to the saguaro cactus, so it's the saguaro meteorite? Sure, why not? Yeah. After taking Dr. Garvey to the two most recent find sites, Jeff shows him the site of the initial find. And this is right where the first one was found, the big one, on somewhere on this little white expanse. Dr. Garvey is in the process of testing the first meteorite Greg found here. It was a beautiful, fairly large stone, several, almost two kilograms in weight. 
just sitting out in the open. Yeah, um, and slightly, slightly buried, as you noted, there is a caliche. So now you see with your own eyes <laughs> how remarkably close these three pieces were. And if there are three in that small an area, you'd think we would therefore find more in the surrounding area, which we have searched quite a bit of. But as you've, as you've noted, you can have find a few in one area, and even though it's all from the same fall, you have to go many miles to find any more. True, very so. true. And which direction in many miles <laughs> do we have to go? That's why we're walking. <laughs> Could it be possible that the guys are hunting in two overlapping strewn fields? If that's the case, the finds would be even more extraordinary. The three meteorites that were found were all found in a relatively small area. So imagine that as the data point. We don't know now where to go around this data point. So now the hard work comes, where are the others relative to that? Back over in Steve and Greg's camp, Greg's wife, Wendy, and dog, Spirit, have rejoined the hunt. Hello. Hey. Wow, you brought out a hot day today. I know. That's okay. That's when she usually drags me out here okay. is when it's unbearably hot. OK. She's uh, definitely got the fever these days. So you take your dog out wandering Wonder. around here. Chase How she gets her exercise? She chases the lizards and the rabbits. OK. Is smart enough to know to stay away from the snakes, so. OK, that's she good. She does well. Hello. Black coat. You know, when I was out here doing her thing is when I stumbled across that first meteorite. Nice. Yep. So she's the one that got me out here. You know, we've got a friend who's uh, trained his dog to visually spot meteorites. Really? And sit down. It's a German Shepherd, and to sit down. <laughs> and, and so then he'll go find him and he'll be sitting in front of it. So. Well, I got some work to do then. Yeah. And then they, they, the, the, the freshly fallen ones will have a smell. And theoretically, you could train a dog to, to smell one of the new ones that fell and maybe go find some other pieces of it. You ever smell one like burnt toast? <laughs> different ones are a little different. The, the carbonaceous ones, um, which are the really valuable ones, but they're really rare. O only a couple percentage of meteorite falls are, are carbonaceous, but they're, they're ones that would be very highly prized and would have a very strong odor, uh, at least in, in the dog sense. So okay. anyway, we you know. know. next dog trick train. is going to be. Yeah, <laughs> fetch. Dog trick. Fetch. Okay. So meanwhile, let's go show her how to find a meteorite, and then maybe she'll pick I'm it up. I'm game. All right. Let's go do it. Let's fan out just a little bit. Fetch, spirit, fetch. As the temperature rises to a blistering 110 degrees, so does the pressure to find more meteorites. This is tough. Normally, if you find a meteorite, the adrenaline kicks in, and it'll carry you for another hour or so. We're not finding anything. There's no adrenaline. It's just willpower at this point. An hour later, Steve does get a shot of adrenaline. And these things are just... Ow! But not the type he was hoping for. Ah! Close encounter of the wrong kind. Ow! Ow! Ow and bleeding. Our friendship and professional relationship with Dr. Garvey is really one of the cornerstones of, of our work. He's a highly respected scientist. So this expedition, for the first time ever, he came out to our habitat, went hunting with us out in the field, and proved himself to be a really good field man. Just because a man sits in a lab doing research for part of his career, don't think he's not a human dynamo out in the field. So I haven't been in this area. And I haven't seen any footprints either, so. Let's, let's look then. OK. By midday, Jeff is feeling less hopeful about finding more meteorites. I was pretty optimistic at the beginning. When I first learned that Greg had found the second stone very close to the first one, I thought, oh, this sounds great. And then he found the third one, and that was yesterday. And now we have quite a few experienced people out here 
hiking around the desert in various types of armored boots, and we haven't found anything in a day and a half. So it's now not looking so good. But can a team effort with metal detectors change their fortune? So there are two things I'd like to try, Greg, if you don't mind. The first is putting the meteorite down on the ground and testing it with the detector to see what kind of signal we get. OK. We'll clean it up afterwards. So the idea here is to answer the question, did any other pieces break off and get buried very nearby? Or was this piece buried and then uncovered while there are others still under the sand? If that's the case, Jeff is hoping metal detectors will help them out. We know it's low in iron, so we're not expecting anything too dramatic. The meteorite Greg found here is low in iron. So low, in fact, it barely sticks to a magnet. So detecting other fragments is going to be difficult. To increase their chances, Jeff is using his most penetrating detector. So we're going to test it with the F-75, which is a really sensitive detector. Um, let me just get it properly calibrated first. All right, so here's our normal audio signature, just on the ground. So nice, clear signal, pretty sharp, but only from very close, because this has comparatively low iron for a meteorite. Well, that's what we want to look for. After several minutes of sweeping the area, Nothing, I'm not getting anything significant. Well, why don't you give it a try? Jeff passes the detector off to Greg. <laughs> That's probably gonna be trash. What do we got? A meteor wrong piece of iron. Next, Wendy. Give this a shot. Okay. See if you can find something better than an old piece of pipe. Here. <laughs> Lady Luck here. But each one comes up empty-handed. We're a bit disappointed that we've conducted a very thorough search, I would say, a good half mile in each direction. And searching for a pretty long day. And that's a lot of area to cover. I think what that really underscores is how rare they are. Rare or not, the guys only have one final day in the desert. Tomorrow, they'll have to give it their all. If we can find one more and line it up with the existing finds, all of which are in a very small area, then we have a direction of flight. And then we can institute a serious large-scale search. But as it is now, we're kind of shooting in the dark. Hunting for meteorites on the ground is not an easy task. But each find, no matter how small, is invaluable to scientists who spend their entire careers studying them. What we do know is that meteorites have survived a fall to Earth after passing through our atmosphere. But exactly where in our solar system did they originate? And what propels them to Earth? At the University of Arizona, Dr. Larry Lobovsky is the senior research assistant at the Division for Planetary Sciences. We have found that the meteorites, or most of the meteorites, come from what we call the asteroid belt. So large asteroids in the asteroid belt that have been broken up and then eventually make their way to Earth. The asteroid belt is positioned between Mars and Jupiter and is clustered by asteroids and infant planets. But what causes a meteorite to separate from its parent asteroid? You have an impact on an asteroid, which may just make a big crater, or may be big enough to just literally break the asteroid completely apart. And then they get into positions in the asteroid belt where gravity tweaks them a little bit into Earth-crossing, Mars-crossing orbits. It's the final day of the expedition in the Sonoran Desert, and Steve decides to try an unconventional two-wheeled approach to his hunt strategy. I have been asked to wait for Steve right here next to the cactus so that he can unveil his new master plan. Can't wait to see what it is. Oh. Hey, check it out. I'm just going to tool around here. Oh, on the bike. On the bike. Oh, that's almost a really good idea. It's the, the thing is, we can see so far, and it almost seems that walking is, it slows us down. 
Well, good luck. All right, thanks. And you're yeah. just going to do it the old school I way. I'm going to do some actual meteorite hunting. All right, see you later. Whoa! Ow! It's Jeff and Steve's third and final day of meteorite hunting in the Sonoran Desert. You gonna go play? I am. I'm gonna try this <laughs> thing out. We got pilot's license. Uh, where we're going, we don't need I'm pilot's license. I'm gonna report you to the FAA. Okay. Have fun. Jeff has dropped Steve off so that he can test his new hunting tool. So what I have here is a little hovercraft that has a building camera. The camera sends the picture back so I can see where it's flying and I can turn the camera and see what's directly under it. Go up. Ah! In theory, hey, if I go over a meteorite, I might be able to see it and run over and get it. <laughs> I can get it off the ground. It's just being able to... Ah! <laughs> oh! <laughs> okay. Around. Come back. Come back. Uh oh. How do I shut it? Turn it off. Go down. The drone wasn't a colossal failure. It 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 flew, it worked. I got started getting the hang of it. So I uh, figured pack that in, go find Jeff, catch up with him, and uh, get back to the old fashioned walking and hunting with eyeballs. After several more hours of hunting by foot, Jeff and Steve have come up empty-handed. And once again, have met up with Greg and Wendy. Jeff, find oh, anything over that direction? It's the A-team. Jeff, find oh, anything over that direction? It's the A-team. Yeah. I found some sand. Did you? Yeah, it's really good sand. Okay. <laughs> So we are tomorrow gonna head up to ASU and see Dr. Garvey, and with your permission, we will begin the classification process Absolutely. of the big find. Absolutely. And I, I know Dr. Garvey wants to look at the second one as well. I've learned so much from being with Steve and Jeff and the knowledge that they have, not only about how to find these things, but also what the story is that they tell. And I'm really looking forward to find out what Dr. Garvey comes back with through this classification, where these space rocks came from. When you work with meteorites full time, the way I do, you don't really go five minutes without talking about classification. Oh, this is an L5, or this is a witness to fall H6 chondrite. These numbers and these classification terms are part of our everyday language. What I have never done is sit in on the entire classification process. So today's a really big day. Not only are we investigating the newest meteorite found in North America, but I'm also going to see how this classification will be given to this new meteorite. It's a pretty big deal for us. Inside certain space rocks, tiny spheres can be found. Those tiny spheres formed when clumps of dust melted and solidified rapidly, creating the crystals. Later, these glassy beads known as chondrules merged into larger bodies known as chondrites. By examining one of the thin slices, Dr. Garvey will be able to determine the presence of any chondrules. So I'm just having a quick scan around the specimen. I'm under a cross-polarized light now, and I'm trying to find an obvious chondrule. And if you see a chondrule, shout chondrule. So we're actually looking at a polished section of the meteorite searching for chondrules. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. Well, there it is. No so, doubt. And it's not even oval, it's circle. OK, what's really amazing here, we actually found a chondrule. So we know we have a chondrite. OK. Chondrites formed in the first several million years of our solar system's history. Chondrites are the oldest solid material in our solar system and are believed to be the building blocks of our planetary system. 
Dr. Garvey thinks it's probably an L5. L stands for low metal. It's actually one of the more common meteorites, but the things that we stumbled across while investigating it are really fascinating. The amazing shock veins in it, which are the most pronounced shock features I've ever seen in a stone meteorite, which we've seen in photographs, but have actually never seen live and in person, never. Dr. Garvey said it was the first time he'd ever seen it in real time. As is the case with this meteorite, L chondrites sometimes bear shock veins, which means they were heavily shocked when their parent body or the asteroid they were once attached to was catastrophically disrupted by a large impact. When we look at a cut and polished section of this meteorite, we see this olive-colored matrix that has been traversed by these black veins, almost like little thin spaghettis that are traversing the sample, about a millimeter or so thick. And this is a very characteristic shock veins that we see in you know, quite a few different types of meteorites. And these form through some sort of early solar system shock event in an incoming asteroid hitting the L chondrite parent body, sending out the shock wave in all directions. And the sample that we actually have is relatively near where that impact took place. Every new meteorite that is collected and studied adds a new piece to the giant puzzle of outer space and helps scientists answer the question, what's out there? Meteorites are some of the oldest material in the solar system, four and a half billion years old. And it's objects like the asteroids that were the building blocks of the planets. The guys may have struck out in the desert on finds, but being part of the classification of North America's newest chondrite is reward enough for Steve. Yeah. Wow. That is unbelievable. What made up for all of that is we got to help contribute to one new meteorite being added to the uh, catalog of meteorites. Look, look oh, at that. Oh, yes. At that. That's amazing. All in all, it was an unexpectedly wonderful Arizona expedition. There are collectors who would stand on their head and hold their breath yeah. to, <laughs> for an hour to have this. And it just goes to show that that phrase, ordinary chondrite, really doesn't mean anything. There's nothing ordinary about chondrites. They're just more of them than other meteorites. But everyone is still special. <laughs> Absolutely amazing.